Well, good morning to those of you in the Americas. Uh, good afternoon if you're in Europe and Africa and good evening to those of you further east. Uh, my name is Steve Lewis and I'm a Senior Director of RISTEC based in the UK. Uh, thank you very much for joining us and welcome to this RISTEC webinar, uh, which is the seventh and actually the penultimate um, webinar of what is our fourth series we've run since May uh, last year. So the topic today is about the risks associated with using hydrogen uh, and how they can be safely managed. Uh, hopefully we can provide some useful and practical insights for you. A quick spot of housekeeping. We've muted everybody so that the sound won't be distorted by any background noise. Um, if you'd like to ask questions, and we really do encourage questions, um, then please use the Q&A function uh, in Zoom and you, you access that by, if you hold your mouse and you pull your, uh, pull your mouse down, the, the tab comes up at the bottom and you can see those two little speech bubbles saying Q&A. Click on that, type in your question, uh, uh, type it in as we go through the webinar and what we'll do is I'll, I'll keep track of those and I'll make sure we uh, cover, as, cover as many of them as we can at the end of the session and certainly within the sort of 40, 45 minutes that we've got uh, available today. Um, don't use the chat function, we've, we've disabled that. Um, just use the Q&A function. Okay, um, I'd now like to briefly introduce RISTEC, uh, for those of you who don't know us. Uh, I know a number of you uh, joining in today have probably heard this uh, 101 times, so I'll be very brief. Um, yeah, so everything we do is associated with risk and safety management in sectors where the impact of loss is high. We are part of the TV Rhineland Group, which is a 2 billion euro provider of testing, inspection and certification services. Yeah, we provide our services across five business lines. So that's consulting, learning, which is online and classroom training and education, uh, resourcing, placing people at client sites, industrial inspection and research and development in the field of risk and safety. I'd like to introduce our speaker today, uh, who is Matt Beeson. Uh, Matt is a principal consultant. He's based in our Derby office here in the UK. Uh, he has over 20 years experience as a risk and safety consultant, uh, working across a number of industry sectors, such as oil and gas, rail, renewables, mining, fairground and leisure manufacturing. So um, quite a, a, a versatile um, experience. He's a chartered member of the Institute of Occupational uh, Safety and Health. He's also a TV Rhine and Certified Functional Safety Engineer. And he's got a great deal of experience with a whole range of um, hazard identification and risk assessment techniques. And there's a set of acronyms there for you. And uh, his most recent experience has been focused on risk management in the clean energy sectors, uh, especially hydrogen which we're going to hear about today, of course, uh, and the wind sector and battery storage systems and geological carbon uh, storage. Okay, Matt, over to you. Thanks very much, Steve. Hi, everyone. The webinar this afternoon, as Steve has said, is about hydrogen. Hydrogen is a very popular subject at the moment that often leads to divided, even polarized opinion. Risk managers often find it helpful to draw a clear distinction between hazards and risks associated with them. I'll be focusing on the properties of gaseous hydrogen that help to define the hazard in relation to the hazards of other fuels and the context of climate change. Firstly, I would like to reflect on some of the reasons why hydrogen is such a popular subject. So hydrogen is a clean energy vector and in both gaseous and liquid forms has the potential to displace fossil fuel equivalents, for example, natural gas and diesel, especially in those sectors which are tricky to decarbonize with electricity alone. Some of the most important advantages of hydrogen are the synergies of generation, transport and application it offers. Generation and storage of electrical power, helping to balance out a renewables focused grid 
generation of hydrogen through electrolysis using surplus renewable energy potentially offers a more scalable solution than pumped hydro or lithium ion batteries. Heating of homes, reusing modified existing infrastructure. Fuel for industry, including synergy with geological carbon storage when hydrogen is produced using steam methane reforming and industry clusters. Vehicles, so ferries, lorries, buses, planes, and maybe even cars. There is also a particularly interesting synergy associated with floating offshore wind installations. Approaches to design of floating foundations and hydrogen electrolysis, where hydrogen generation and storage potentially offers an alternative to direct electrical connection with the grid. The main reason for considering hydrogen is that it is cleaner from an environmental perspective at the point of use than other fuels. Burning, and, burning hydrogen produces only water vapor as opposed to CO2. However, it is important to bear in mind that hydrogen is also potentially a secondary greenhouse gas with a global warming potential six times that of CO2. Scientific sources on this subject are not easily found, but care should be taken when, vented, but when venting hydrogen. Even at six times the global warming potential of CO2, however, hydrogen would remain an approximately fourfold improvement on methane and natural gas as a fuel in terms of global warming potential. How could we have a webinar about hydrogen safety without showing a picture of the Hindenburg? This image still permeates public impressions of hydrogen nearly a hundred years since the tragedy occurred. This is a reminder of how a negative incident that works its way into the public imagination can damage an industry, or in this case, two industries. Even now, modern airships use helium when hydrogen makes much more sense economically if the hazards and risks can be managed. There are multiple theories as to the initiating cause of the fire, which do include hydrogen ignited by static. Not all of the theories include hydrogen, although obviously the hydrogen will have burned at some stage of the conflagration. In 2019, a bit more up to date, there were three hydrogen explosions as shown on this slide. The Norway explosion resulted in two people being sent to hospital after the explosion overpressure triggered an airbag in a car nearby. The South Korea accident was a hydrogen tank explosion which resulted in two people killed and six people injured. The Illinois accident was a hydrogen blast at a factory. Four workers were killed and another seriously injured. The blast was felt 30 kilometers from the facility. Such incidents clearly have the potential to take a serious toll, both in terms of the potential for fatalities and injuries and on public perception of hydrogen. There could be a knock-on effect on the potential for hydrogen to support decarbonisation. South Korea in particular are still wrestling with the aftermath of the incident there. There have been a number of studies carried out regarding the public perception of hydrogen. These are some of the outcomes from one study that considered a representative sample of the UK adult population. Public knowledge and understanding of hydrogen and hydrogen blending is low. However, once informed, support for and willingness to use blended hydrogen becomes moderately high. Safety concerns do not seem insurmountable, but negative perceptions of hydrogen as dangerous are important. There is clearly therefore a duty on safety professionals and risk managers to ensure safety of hydrogen to protect life and prevent injury, but also to enable the progression of the hydrogen industry, avoiding incidents that may jeopardize the hydrogen contribution to decarbonization and meeting climate targets. There are myths about the hazards of hydrogen, which are only partly true. Some of these are shown on this slide. Hydrogen is hazardous like any fuel, it is also often stored at high pressures. However, the properties of hydrogen both give and take away when looked at in the round. The next slides will look at the actual properties of hydrogen and implications for safety and risk management in an attempt to explode some of these myths. Firstly, hydrogen is flammable over a very wide range of concentrations, four to 77%. 
That is to say that below the lower flammable limit of 4%, hydrogen will not be ignited because there is insufficient fuel. The mixture with air is too lean. Further, above the upper flammable limit of 77%, there will be insufficient oxygen to ignite the hydrogen. The mixture is too rich. By means of comparison, the flammable range of natural gas is approximately 5 to 15%. Stoichiometric concentration is the concentration at which all reactants are consumed. Less energy is required in order to ignite a mixture that is closer to its stoichiometric composition, and more energy can be expected to be released. The stoichiometric concentration for hydrogen is around 29.5% compared to 9.5% for natural gas. For a given combustible mixture, and an ignition type, there is a concentration dependent minimum energy below which ignition does not occur. The minimum ignition energy becomes infinite at the flammable limit. As shown in the figure to the right of this slide, a source of, with ignition energy of 0.24 millijoules will not ignite methane or propane, but it will ignite a mixture of hydrogen and air within the concentration range of 6.5 to 58% volume of hydrogen. A source with energy of one millijoule will ignite a hydrogen air mixture with hydrogen content ranging from six to 64%. At the limits of flammability, the ignition energy is somewhat similar for the three foot fuels shown on this diagram. Many ignition sources would be able to provide the level of energy required to ignite hydrogen. Hydrogen has a high immediate ignition probability some sources suggest approximately six times higher than methane. This may translate to approximately 60% of releases resulting in jet fires or small explosions. The reason for this is not fully understood. However, it is likely to be due to the lower energies required for ignition, at least in part. This clearly does not mean that hydrogen will always ignite immediately. There is a residual probability of at least 40% for unignited release with then a credible risk of delayed ignition and explosion. However, the higher immediate ignition probability does reduce the probability of higher consequence events. Hydrogen is the lightest element and is very buoyant. Hydrogen releases will always tend to rise, particularly as the negative Joule-Thomson coefficient leads to heating as the gas expands on release. However, because hydrogen tends to be stored at higher pressures than other fuels, release rates will also tend to be higher and momentum-driven phase will be significant. Risk assessment should therefore give consideration to the potential for hydrogen gas to collect, such as in buildings, roofed shelters, and trees. Hydrogen gas is colorless and odorless. However, there is rhinology evidence from high deployed projects, among others, to suggest that odorization works very well using existing odorants. The dangerous substances and explosive atmosphere regulations, DESIR, require the risk assessment of the use and storage of dangerous substances with the potential to form explosive atmospheres, such as hydrogen. The assessment may require the identification and classification of hazardous areas within which potential ignition sources must be controlled. The radii of these hazardous areas needs to be calculated and defined. Many hazardous area calculation standards have limited applicability to hydrogen. For example, the IGEM SR25 standard is being revised at the moment, and the lookup tables in the Energy Institute Code of Practice 15 are only applicable for refinery hydrogen, up to 80% in the stream. The hazard radius increases as the percentage of hydrogen in the stream increases. This is illustrated by the diagram on this slide. The green circle is obtained from the lookup tables in the Energy Institute Code of Practice 15, EI 15, for a G1 gas type natural gas containing up to 25% hydrogen. The orange circle is obtained from the lookup tables in EI 15, for a G2 gas type, so that's refinery hydrogen containing up to 80% hydrogen. As I mentioned, EI15 doesn't go beyond 80% hydrogen, so the red circle is modelled using DNV fast modelling software, consequence modelling software, for 100% hydrogen distance to lower flammable limit, so 4% in air, 
using the modeling parameters provided by the EI15 code of practice. And you can see that as the percentage of hydrogen in the stream increases, so does the hazard radius within which ignition sources need to be controlled. Reactivity is a material specific property and hydrogen is about as reactive as it gets. This property affects burning velocity, flame front speed and ignitability. The reactivity of hydrogen has an impact on the selection of electrical equipment for use in the hazardous area, as we discussed previously. Hydrogen is group 2C, which is the most onerous group compared to methane and natural gas, which are group A, 2A. A general upshot of this and the previous slide is that any hazardous area classification carried out for natural gas would need to be revisited if more than 25% hydrogen is introduced into the stream. The first goal of process safety is to keep it in the pipe. Hydrogen poses some challenges in this respect. Due to hydrogen having the smallest molecular size, molecular weight and low viscosity, hydrogen has the ability to leak at a higher flow rate than other gases. Hydrogen is also able to permeate through unbroken materials. The high pressure hydrogen storage systems, hydrogen would leak nearly three times faster than natural gas and over five times faster than propane. However, the low volumetric energy density, VED, of hydrogen means it would produce substantially lower energy leakage rates. Hydrogen's small molecular size increases the likelihood of the occurrence of leaks. However, there is assurance evidence from the H21 project to suggest that systems that were leak tight for natural gas will be leak tight for hydrogen up to seven bar. There is a dedicated hydrogen modeling package called HIRAM, which contains default data for leak frequencies for hydrogen components. Probabilities were developed from a Bayesian process using generic leak probabilities and available hydrogen data. Leak frequencies of the hydrogen components are expressed as a function of leak size, which is defined as a percentage of pipe diameter, 0.01%, 1%, 100%, and so forth. The use of a Bayesian approach allows for the differentiation of various sources with varying amounts of importance, provides probability distributions that can be propagated through quantitative risk assessment models, and provides a method for determining leakage rates for different sizes of leaks. The results of a Bayesian analysis can be updated as new data are gathered. If in the future a great amount of hydrogen data is collected, the results of traditional and Bayesian statistical approaches will converge. The high diffusivity of hydrogen is a benefit during release as it aids dispersion. However, the small molecular size and high diffusivity can be a problem in the pipe. Not all metals are equally susceptible to hydrogen embrittlement. The challenge for dealing with the potential for hydrogen embrittlement is less a safety challenge and more an economic one. Hydrogen is processed safely in refineries around the world. There are accepted good practice metallurgical solutions for hydrogen and more even onerous uh, and, and, and more for even on, more onerous uh, high sour hydrogen sulfide service. Stainless steels are often used, but this may be prohibitively expensive if hydrogen is to be processed widely. Projects are underway across the world investigating safe and economic materials for hydrogen surface. These projects have seen a degree of success, particularly with the use of polyethylene and X52 grade steel. So we've looked at hydrogen when it's in the pipe and some of its basic properties once released. This slide and the next will look at the properties of hydrogen following ignition. Hydrogen flames are difficult to see in daylight unless they're seeded with impurities. Although not impossible because turbulence may be discernible, they may also be audible due to the gas escaping. Hydrogen fires have a low radiant heat, so you can't sense the presence of a flame until you are very close to it, or unfortunately, sometimes even in it. The picture on the left shows a demonstration of how close one can get to a hydrogen flame before feeling uncomfortable as a result of the heat. Where people are not under time pressure and aware that they should be looking for a hydrogen fire, they may be able to identify the presence of such a fire reasonably easily. However, if people are evacuating in an emergency 
or hurrying due to time pressure, then there is the potential that they will not detect such a fire. As we discussed previously, the higher immediate ignition probability of hydrogen potentially reduces the likelihood of delayed ignition and explosion when compared to other less reactive substances such as natural gas. The buoyancy of hydrogen also helps to reduce the likelihood that hydrogen gas will collect. However, the higher reactivity of hydrogen means that if delayed ignition of collected hydrogen gas does occur, the consequences are likely to be more severe, particularly when the mixture in the air approaches the stoichiometric concentration. Hydrogen is highly reactive and has been observed to undergo, undergo deflagration to detonation transition or DDT. DDT is more probable with high reactivity fuels. A flammable cloud can occupy a congested volume and extend out into the open. DDT ignites inside the congested region, then runs into the flammable cloud outside of the congested region, which changes the blast load considerably, increasing overpressures and increasing the amount of damage that can occur. When an explosive mixture is at stoichiometric concentrations, DDT can occur without confinement. DDT is a rare occurrence and the exact mechanisms of what causes it are not fully understood. However, the local geometry, including presence of obstacles, will contribute to increasing the likelihood. Computational fluid dynamics models, CFD, are better at taking into account local geometrical factors such as these. However, effective modeling of DDT is still problematic. There's no debate regarding the credibility of confined explosions, although accurate modeling is difficult. Uh, new tools that attempt to take into account challenges such as the presence of obstacles, stratification, brittle nature of masonry structures, and DDT are currently under development. In summary, the properties of hydrogen affect the way it behaves in the pipe, outside of the pipe, and on loss of containment. These include embrittlement, leak frequency, the immediate ignition probability, buoyancy, the negative Joule-Thompson coefficient, the large flammable range, reactivity, and the potential for deflagration to detonation transition, and the ignition probability, and also the fact that it is difficult to detect a fire that does occur. As mentioned previously, However, these properties both give and take away from a risk management perspective. Embrittlement, for example. Dealing with hydrogen embrittlement and similar fluid issues is not a new challenge. The challenge is in the economics in providing materials that are safe and inexpensive for larger scale rollout of hydrogen technologies. Hydrogen has the smallest molecular size and has a propensity to leak. However, leakages are lower energy and there is assurance evidence to suggest that at low pressures, sub seven bar, a system that was leak tight for natural gas will also be leak tight for hydrogen. It is difficult to detect a hydrogen fire or leak, however, not impossible. There have been successes with rhinology and hydrogen is non-toxic. Issues around detection need to be taken into account when preparing for emergencies. On loss of containment, hydrogen will tend to rise due to the positive effects of buoyancy and also the heating effect due to the negative Joule-Thompson coefficient. Hydrogen will also tend to ignite immediately. However, we mustn't ignore momentum due to the higher storage pressures, which can be significant. The increased likelihood of immediate ignition means that lower consequence jet fires are significantly more likely than higher consequence explosions. However, if a delayed ignition and explosion does occur, the consequences are likely to be severe with the potential for detonation and significant overpressures. So the properties of hydrogen contribute to making the hazard different, but the challenges for risk management are neither more nor less onerous than for other substances. Hydrogen is an important cog in the wheel to mitigate climate change. It was reported in February this year in the New Scientist magazine and in other sources that we are way off target 
to keep warming below the 1.5 degrees C that we need to mitigate dangerous climate change. It's clear that any further delays could cost many lives due to damaging climate change. This places even greater importance on safety and risk management. Knowledge around hydrogen safety is growing all the time. We must make effort to learn and be doubly vigilant. We must plan for and manage crises. We must reduce the risk, be safe to protect lives, of course, but avoiding hugely negative reputational impact will save many lives in the long run as well. The true hydrogen hazard may be in failing to deliver the safety and risk management required to ensure that hydrogen realizes its true potential as a green energy vector. This slide shows a link to the HSC Safe Net Zero 2021 hydrogen event that took place in early, uh, early part of this month. Um, at this event, the HSC presented their vision of safety as enabler for hydrogen. It's still possible to register for this to download the on-demand content, and I thoroughly recommend it. In summary then, there are challenges for risk management of hydrogen due to the innate hazardous properties. These challenges are not insurmountable, provided that we are aware of them and avoid falling foul of some common myths. Hydrogen offers potentially huge synergies and benefits for avoiding catastrophic climate change. Safety and risk management play a huge role as enabler now to protect lives in the longer run. Thank you very much. And I will hand over to Steve to facilitate the questions. Excellent, thank you very much, uh, Matt. Okay, um, so we've now got the chance to um, answer any questions that are coming through. So if please type your questions um, using the Q&A function. And just whilst we're waiting for those to come through, I, I, I was, I just had an initial question, Matt. Um, you know, you've outlined all the challenges there and I, I like the way you presented them on the, the bow tie diagram. I mean, in your opinion, which do you think is going to be the hardest challenge to overcome? It's a, uh, a good question. I think um, for me, the, the biggest safety challenge that we're going to need to overcome is, well, it, it, it's very much to do with the amount we have to do in the, in the space of time in which we have to do it, I think, if hydrogen is to play a significant part in mitigating climate change. And we're going to, there's a lot of assurance that needs to be gathered. And this needs to take into account of uh, how hydrogen may need to be, hydrogen facilities may need to be located um, near to other sensitive resources in residential areas, for instance, or, or next to um, uh, existing industrial areas. Taking, taking that into account, you know, there may be a shortness of space and we need to make sure that we, you know, we can mitigate uh, congestion factors. Um, I think, you know, hydrogen does want to um, rise, it does want to disperse, um, it does want to diffuse into the atmosphere. Um, we just need to be able to give it the potential uh, to, to do that. And yeah, so I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges is, is making sure that we can, um, we can integrate hydrogen effectively in, in areas where we need to do it, because it's, it's not going to necessarily be um, uh, you know, out in the middle of nowhere. I, I did talk about floating offshore wind platforms, obviously, and, and, and there the, the risk is perhaps more easy to mitigate. Um, but, you know, if we are introducing hydrogen refi uh, uh, refueling stations into residential areas, then that is going to be a particular concern. But really, you know, it is also about doing this economically and making the economics um, work, uh, because you know, that, that, that's you know, going to also be one of the things that prevents us from realizing our climate targets. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, question from Mohammed. Uh, when you talk about the embrittlement threat, mm -hmm. do you mean when hydrogen is in the liquid phase or can it happen even as a gas? Uh, it can happen as, as both a liquid and a gas to my understanding. Although as I did mention, we are learning all the time. Thank you. Uh, question from Mahmoud. Um, how would you investigate safe and economic hydrogen process in refineries? Um, well, I think uh, use of hydrogen in refineries is something that is um, is generally well understood and is is, is relatively commonplace. I I think. Um, 
one of the things that we may see as a benefit from wider hydrogen rollout, I'm not exactly sure how much of a benefit this would be, but it's, it's certainly possible, is that we, we may well see that the research on hydrogen and making it more safe and economic having an impact on refineries such that future refineries can perhaps be built with uh, more in inexpensive materials rather than using uh, stainless steel or other such um, materials. There could be knock-on effects from the sort of wider research into hydrogen on uh, maybe making hydrogen safer and more economical in refineries. I'm not sure if that quite answers the question, but I do think there, there, there could well be some knock-on uh, benefits there. Okay, question from Rajesh. Which sector do you think should take up as a priority hydrogen uh, to give confidence to the public about safety? Um, I, I guess uh, I'll, I'll perhaps jump in with my, my favourite um, <laughs> topic at the moment. It is perhaps uh, steel refineries. Um, so industry clusters and steel refineries. So perhaps using steam methane reforming to produce hydrogen from uh, natural gas, um, storing the carbon dioxide uh, geologically, um, perhaps also storing the hydrogen geologically, but but using that hydrogen as, as a way of... Um, greening steel uh, because clearly the, the renewables industry has a reliance on steel uh, when we build offshore wind turbines we need the steel to do that but we need to make the steel green as well and i think hydrogen is one of the best um, solutions for that and that may well uh, you know be, be industry leading the way but i know that there is an awful lot of research ongoing at the moment into making sure that hydrogen is safe to use in the home and you know when we do get down to that level there are some at, at lower pressures there may well be some definite safety advantages to hydrogen over natural gas. Thank you. A uh, question from Ian. Does RISTEC believe that there will be a greater onus on demonstrating tolerability and a LARP for a hydrogen facility uh, compared to a quote-unquote conventional hydrocarbon or petrochemical petrochemical facility? Um, that's a very, very good question. And uh, I think probably we need to defer to the regulator on that one. But I, I would suggest that, you know, demonstration of a LARP is ultimately a, a goal that we need to achieve. And we need to make sure that we do the risk management exercises that we need to do in order to achieve that goal. So, I don't think it will necessarily be more onerous, but I do think that, you know, especially as, as, as the industry is developing at the moment, there does perhaps need to be more of an effort put in uh, to making sure that the cases we build, at least in these early days, are, are more robust than perhaps the lengths we will go to for, for another facility. But again, I think my main reason for saying that is not necessarily because I think the regulator would require it, but more because I would be you know, definitely concerned about the reputational impact of uh, hydrogen incidents at this point and, you know, and, and, and how that might set us back and, and lead to, to greater cost of life in the longer run. So I think I was a little bit of a slopey shouldered uh, answer, Ian, but um, hopefully that gives a little bit of flavor to your, to your question. Yeah, thanks, Matt. A uh, question from Eleanor. Are the risks known at lower pressures of gas containment with mixture of natural gas? At what pressure is the low molecular of weight of hydrogen an influence? Um, so this is, this is a good question. I think, um, as I mentioned during the talk, there, uh, there is quite a bit of assurance evidence to suggest that at sub- um, seven bar hydrogen systems will be as, as leak tight as, as as they would be for for natural gas um, however there is still i think a long way to go to uh, demonstrate this categorically um, but i did also say that i do think there are some advantages to um, uh, to hydrogen in those lower pressure 
situations. For, for, for instance, the lower energy leakage rates um, may well tend to translate when we're at the millibar level as we would be in, in our homes to producing much lower energy gas clouds, which have a much more greater tendency to, to diffuse and, and leak out of our homes once they are there than, than natural gas. And natural gas would probably have a, a greater potential to collect in the home than hydrogen. I'm not quite sure that really answers your question, but I do think that at lower pressures of hydrogen, as we would experience in, in the home, uh, I do think there is there are, there are some safety benefits to be gained, but I think the, the, the final sort of categoric nature of those safety benefits is, is yet to be fully determined. Thank you. Question from um, Mustafa. Uh, is hydrogen already being used as a pure fuel instead of natural gas anywhere in the world? Um, so, uh, that yes, it, yes, it is. Um, I, I know, for instance, uh, there is a new, a new project coming up at an airport um, in the north of the UK. Uh, for a combined heat and power system that, use, that uses hydrogen and actually burns the hydrogen. Uh, so that, that, that's coming up. But yes, so, so use of hydrogen um, in boilers as a, as a pure fuel, it, it, it is being researched and it, it, it is being done. Um, uh, it, it's, it's certainly not what I understand to be commonplace, uh, but, it, but it, it, it does exist as a, as a pure fuel. OK, question from Mustafa. Uh, would you please refer to a hydrogen process safety best practice uh, standard, etc.? And if there is a comparative study uh, to differentiate additional control measures to those in place for natural gas? So um, one of the things that you know is the issue at the moment for, for risk management is that not all of this good practice that you're alluding to there exists in, in one place at the minute. So there are, there are standards being developed for uh, development of, of boilers, for instance, that use, that use hydrogen. There are some very, very good um, guidance documents on the properties of hydrogen um, that are sort of norm normative to, it, it, to, some, to some degree. However, to my knowledge, there are, there are no uh, dedicated um, hydrogen process safety standards um, at the moment. And, for me, that reinforces the importance of this sort of risk assessment process from, from first principles, taking into account uh, the, um, uh, the different requirements of um, hydrogen and natural gas and methane, for example, uh, and the properties associated with, with hydrogen. Um, I think in, in large part, the processes that we follow for risk assessment are largely unchanged. So I used Bowtie as an example to illustrate some of my points at the end. And um, uh, Bowtie, for instance, is a very, very good qualitative risk assessment tool to support risk assessment of hydrogen that we've used in the past in, in RISTEC, hazard identification using checklists. So if you develop the checklist to be more specific to hydrogen, it can be very, very effective. HAZUP doesn't change whether you do it for hydrogen or something else. Um, all of these risk assessment techniques are still perfectly valid for hydrogen as anything else. Even the approach for any, in the DSEA uh, proof code of practice, for instance, is exactly the same for hydrogen as it is for anything else. It's more the detailed calculation of hazard radius and, and other things that are, that are more difficult uh, at that sort of lower level when it comes to hydrogen. So I think good practice and standards are still very much in development at the moment, there is a lot of good information out there. Um, iGEM uh, are releasing a, a sort of a, a knowledge bank soon, uh, which will be a, a, a repository of lots and lots of this, of this information, a very useful um, source. Uh, but for me, it reinforces the importance of, of that sort of full risk assessment process and making sure that you identify the hazards, you deal with them um, uh, with risk analysis, you make your assessment and then you treat the risks appropriately uh, from a, a more first, first principles hydrogen-based approach. Okay, thank you. Uh, question from T. Are there any specific or different hazards arising from underground storage of hydrogen? See, that, that's very interesting. Um, so there are research projects ongoing at the moment looking at this. 
and it's not exactly a subject that I know an awful lot about. Um, I do know a little bit about uh, geological carbon uh, CO2 storage um, and the, you know, the issues associated with uh, buoyancy and the tendency to rise for CO2. Uh, I, I certainly would um, suppose that those risks are potentially higher for hydrogen. However, um, the plan for hydrogen storage, as I understand it, is to use um, salt caverns, which provide a, an effective impermeable layer uh, to the hydrogen, although I think the research is, is still out, um, it still needs to be done on the extent to which that, um, that barrier is, is truly uh, impermeable. But I think it, it, there's a good solution, and it, it, it is a potentially a good solution, and it's a potentially a safe solution. Uh, the research needs to be done, but it, it could well be better than, um, you know, very large tanks at high pressure um, or, or the equivalent above ground. Thank you. Question from Nigel. How much does the minimum ignition energy and flammability levels change with temperature, say over 500 degrees C in chemical processes? Um, uh, they, they increase, essentially. So uh, they, they do change quite quite a bit. Um, and, and they, you know, as, as you increase with, with any substance, uh, as you increase the temperature, the um, flammability range increases and, and the initial energy reduces. Okay, question. I from... don't know if, if you want specific, <laughs> specifics necessarily, but um, yeah, I think, I think hydrogen is, isn't necessarily too different to other uh, um, substances in that, in that res in the respect that it does change. Sorry, Steve, go on. No, that's okay. Yeah, thank you. Yes, yeah, th thanks for that extra bit uh, at the end there. A uh, question from John. Uh, do you have any comparative information on the energy conversion of natural gas to hydrogen or electrolysis, i.e. how much energy is required per unit of hydrogen energy output? Um, I don't have the exact numbers to hand, but it's not particularly efficient. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why I did, I, I hope I did stress in the presentation earlier that surplus renewable energy is what is really needed um, to, to convert um, uh, ele electrical power into hydrogen. Um, there, hydrogen is not the most efficient of, of the um, uh, energy vectors we, we have available, but it, you know, it, it, could be, it could be much more um, uh, lower cost as a, as a storage solution than some of the other um, possibilities. And if we don't have something like hydrogen to balance out a more renewables focused grid, then um, uh, really that does mean an awful lot more uh, renewable energy would need to be required and perhaps even more wastage uh, as a result, or perhaps we need more nuclear as, as an alternative. So it, it's not necessarily presenting uh, hydrogen as a, uh, as a panacea, uh, it isn't very efficient from from the perspectives that you're you're referring to, but it it can um, its strength lies in in those synergies. The fact that it, if you have hydrogen, you can use it for multiple purposes, and it, it provides that resource of stored energy once you have it. I okay, hope thank that you. Your question. <laughs> yeah, th yeah th thanks, Matt. Okay, um, we'll make this the the last question. Um, it's a sort of follow on fairly technical question from Eleanor. Um, will the low molecular weight of hydrogen create the extra risk of inflow of air in piping when the pressure in the piping is low? At what pressure is this risk not present? I have experienced incidents with low pressure in piping with small amounts of hydrogen and it resulted in explosion in, in the piping when breaking a flange. That's an interesting question. It must, I must admit it's not something I've looked at um, uh, Specifically, I do um, think that these 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 really are, are risks that do need to be managed for, for any substance, and the the risk of, of air ingress uh, for any substance at, at lower pressures. I think the it really perhaps comes down to your to your piping design, making sure that your piping design is is um, fit for purpose. Um, and if you are going to be working with lower pressures, making sure that those pipes are still essentially full and pressurized to the extent that they, they need to be to prevent um, oxygen ingress. But uh, ultimately, I think that that's a, um, a risk that we, we would experience uh, across the board, regardless of the, um, of the substance that we are um, handling. 
Um, and, but also you do have the advantage that with hydrogen, if, if you are going to greater lengths to ensure leak tightness, that will also prevent um, ingress as well as egress. Okay, Matt, thank you very much. Um, I think we need to wrap up now. Um, what we will do is make a recording available to everybody, uh, probably be by close of business tomorrow now. Um, when you leave the webinar, uh, you should automatically receive a survey in your browser. I think it will literally take you, you know, 15 seconds to complete that. And we really appreciate it if, if you would. Um, we do appreciate your feedback, especially if you have any topics um, for future webinars that you'd like to hear um, from us on. Um, also, if you've got any other questions arising from what, from what you've heard today, or you just like any information on any of our services, uh, do please email us. And Matt will just pop up a, a couple of email addresses up on the screen now. Um, or probably the easiest thing actually is to just go to our website. Um, and there are a ton of forms on, on the pages on the website, uh, which you can just fill in and uh, we'll get back to you shortly. Okay, so thank you, Matt, uh, once again. And thank you everyone else for your attention. Uh, we're really grateful for you, you know, taking the time out of your busy schedule to, to listen in to us today. Uh, the next webinar is on Monday. Same time, so that's three o'clock UK time. Um, it's actually the last in the current series, and it's about using instant investigation to learn from the past so as to improve the future. So hopefully you can join us for that one too. Uh, in the meantime, please stay safe and stay secure uh, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Goodbye.